One thing that I feel like women are not hearing enough is the anxiety, the depression, your inability to handle stress. This is because of what you just said. I love the idea of it's a brain recalibration. But what women are, are doing when those symptoms appear is they're turning to SSRIs, they're getting divorced. They're, you know, what leaving jobs because they feel that it's their, it's the problem is outside of them. But if they understood yeah. that the brain was recalibrating, they yeah. may have a little more compassion for themselves and the people around them. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Minnie in the house. All right. <laughs> I appreciate that. The carnivore diet. Because of what we eat. Honestly, you've really touched my heart. I want to really start off with like this idea about perimenopause being the second puberty, because uh, I wish somebody had told me that when I hit 40, that I was in for a massive change and I don't feel like it's being discussed enough. So can, can you start off and explain why you call perimenopause the second puberty? Yeah. As you saw, there's there's a diagram in my book that shows I really like this this sort of mirror image of the hormones. Like in our childhood, we have low estrogen and progesterone, of course, that's normal. And then in first puberty, estrogen fires up quite dramatically, quite a few years before progesterone manages to get going. And then the reverse happens in second puberty, which is actually anywhere from about age 35. Some women will start having these changes at age 35. And it's, it's literally a mirror image of that. Progesterone starts to go away first, estrogen spiking up. So that combination of high estrogen and low progesterone is a lot of what's going on in our forties. And that continues for up to a decade. And then finally with the final period, about a year after the final period, we drop back down to that stable state of relatively low hormone levels. And the thing that's important about second puberty is that it's temporary, right? Mm. I can't tell you how much messaging I see confusing, like just in the mainstream media, like confusing perimenopause, which is this time of transition, time of symptoms, time of turbulence with menopause, which I know I use menopause. I mean, some people say post-menopause, but I use menopause to mean the life phase that begins one year after the final period. So those, and that's three decades of our life and that should be fairly stable state and fairly healthy and not a problem. It's these 10 or so years in our forties. <laughs> 10 years. And I think if a lot of women knew that that was temporary, yep. they would feel a lot differently about it. And in, in chapter one of my book, Hormone Repair Manual, I give the example of women being diagnosed with things like fibromyalgia in their forties thinking, oh, that's how I, I'm always going to be now. And actually it's really just part of this somewhat inflammatory, somewhat, you know, anxiety producing, sleep disturbing hormonal change. It, so do you think it's normal for a 35 year old to go into perimenopause? Or are we seeing changes, hormonal changes at younger ages now? Okay. Well, I think, so how we define perimenopause is really based on symptoms, right? Like when we start to experience symptoms from that drop in progesterone, arguably like from a perspective of evolutionary mismatch, I don't know how much if your listeners, if you talk about that on your podcast, but um, go for it through the lens of evolutionary mismatch, you know, I think, I think perimenopausal, I think, I think perimenopausal symptoms in general are not normal. I think they're a, Mm. you know, a downstream effect from lots of things going on in our modern environment, including food environment and environmental toxins, things we don't necessarily have control over. But there's no reason like biologically why this change should cause so many symptoms. It's mm. So I guess I, we can talk more about that. Yeah. But in terms of answer to your question, like how early does it start? Well, it's normal for the final period to be anywhere from age 45 to 55. And I don't think that's changed very much. I mean, I know, yes, there's some evidence that smoking or environmental toxins can bring the timing a little bit earlier, but in general, through my biologist lens, because my first degree, my first career was as an evolutionary biologist, all the evidence points to the fact that we are genetically programmed to stop ovulating in our late 40s, early 50s, that's not, I mean, that's a normal thing. So then the question is in the years leading up to that, I would say it could be normal to start that years leading up to that process by your late thirties. Um, 
do you just what, just like we look I, at just like we're seeing uh, i mean this was my thought process was just like we're seeing uh, teenagers go into puberty earlier, you know, nine-year-olds, eight-year-olds, seven-year-olds. Yes. I feel like I'm hearing more 35-year-olds experiencing perimenopausal symptoms, missing cycles, spotting. And I just keep asking myself if that's, if that's normal, is that what's supposed to yeah. happen? Well, I haven't seen any evidence that it's coming earlier. I might be wrong about that. I might've missed some of the studies, but again, I'd say, I think the, the, severity of the symptoms is not normal it's common mm -hmm. and so if anyone's listening and having yeah. symptoms in your late 30s it's not that you've done something wrong or you know th this is a common thing that's happening which is why I wrote the book about it um mm -hmm. I think you have a book too about yeah. this process yeah. it, it can be very symptomatic um yeah and I guess I'll just say again I think the severity of the symptoms is probably linked to a lot of things in our modern environment including environmental toxins yes um I might yeah. speak to one of them, but um, just one of an example of that. Just Go to for it. A teaser of what I'm talking about. There's lots, lots to talk about, but I include these citations in my book. So there's a couple of papers suggesting or you know, building the case that some of the neurological symptoms of perimenopause, and a lot of the symptoms are neurological, you know, sleep, reduced ability to cope with stress, brain fog, migraines, all of these hot flushes hot, or hot hot flashes as we say in North America I still have my <laughs> I, I'm currently in Canada I'm Canadian but I am I've been down under for a long long time oh my so gosh so you have I like a have, hybrid accent huh <laughs> I do I start to have the lingo of um Australia New Zealand but um yeah it's about there's some evidence about body burden of lead which is Ooh. fascinating which is a little bit scary because you think about it I mean when I was a kid I'm 51 when I was a kid there was leaded gasoline you know, there was lead in houses, paint, you know, this is, and so by body burden, as you, I'm sure you know, like when we're exposed to certain kinds of toxins, particularly lead, the body sequesters it in the skeleton. So it's been in our bones, it's been in my bones for 45 years. And then there's some evidence that when, with the drop in estrogen, which is normal, um, and the mobilization of bone the increased bone turnover that starts up because of that that releases lead into the system it hits the brain that that could be responsible for some of the anxiety and neurological symptoms and when I read those papers really rang true to me that said that makes sense so that's an example that's just one example of evolutionary mismatch right like here we are attributing mm -hmm. all these symptoms just to the hormonal change but I think there's other things going on intersecting with that hormonal change. Well, I am a hundred percent with you on the lead. Um, I yeah. you know my story, uh, going through perimenopause and I'm, I'm like three months without a period right now. So yeah. God only knows where I am, but, <laughs> yeah. um, but was that I, I felt really healthy at 40. I was working out all the time. I was on the paleo diet. I wasn't fasting. I, I was eating all day. I still thought breakfast was the most important meal of the day. And if I ate more, yeah. my metabolism would speed up. Um, and like about 43, all my perimenopausal symptoms came crashing down on me. Yeah. And one of the big things I found was exactly what you just said was lead and um, that how it had been stored. And then I went on to discover that it's actually can be generational and it can get actually passed down in the womb and get stored in your tissues, but it's the swing of estrogen that releases it. Like you said, right. So you, you measured your lead, your serum lead, yes. lead levels. Oh, oh. I and Intriguing. I actually, yeah. I actually yep. watch it and detox it a lot. It, detoxing lead gave me my sleep back. Yeah. So, so what do you, I mentioned a couple of things in my book about detoxing lead. I mean, I talk about glycine and N-acetylcysteine. What do you, and selenium, calcium, yep. what do you, what do you use? Well, so a... yeah, it's a great conversation. So yeah. we, we go through three steps. We do, we prepare the body. So we do a set of, um, supplements that support liver health, kidney health, uh, high powered probiotic. Uh, and then we get nutrients to mitochondria, uh, uh, the proper omega three, six, nine balance for the outside of the cell. So we usually spend about a month like preparing the body. And then we have a, a right. whole system where we pull it out of the body first. And then we oh, pull do... it out of our brain, out of oh, the brain. Right. So you're doing like a chelation kind of thing, right? Yeah. Think yeah. of it like chelation, but we use a lot of binders, uh, activated charcoal, zeolites, 
um, because as stuff comes out, we want to make sure it gets out the gut. Um, and uh, we're very slow and systematic. I, I, it took me about six months of detoxing before I started to see my sleep come back. Um, but it was such a game changer. Like I literally went at 43 from being depressed and anxious and not sleeping and hot flashes discovered lead in my, and mercury was a little bit, but lead was my biggie spent six months detoxing and all those symptoms went away. Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been sort of plodding along with a sort of a continuous gentle, like pulling, trying to pull the lead out yeah. through the, you know, through the gut I, and the kidneys. It's, but yeah, it's, um, it's definitely something, I mean, that's, and that's just one example of right. things that can be going on. And I, I want to actually, one thing I'd like to talk about now, if it's yeah, okay, go for is, it. I really want to debunk the narrative that menopause is unnatural because we now outlive our ovaries. Like that particular narrative is really, I find well, it's just, it's just irks not me, basically. I just really want to, because okay, as tell a- Tell us more, as, yeah. Yeah, because as an evolutionary biologist and, and what I've, you know, through that lens and a lot of interesting books, there's a book called, um, which I always reference her book called The Slow Moon, uh, Slow Moon Climbs by mm -hmm. Susan Matter. And she builds the case from a, kind of from a good looking way back paleolithic all the way through, you know, all the way through historical and using um, evidence from modern day or hunter-gatherer, forager people, looking at building the case that menopause is not new that in fact quite the opposite that she builds the case that human longevity for both sexes evolved or was selected for because a couple of decades post-reproductive for women is so incredibly valuable for looking after descendants and passing on those long-lived mm. genes. So it's a really intriguing, it's basically That's this cool. idea, yeah, basically building the case that for really as long as we've been human, however long that is, a couple hundred thousand years, it seems likely we've been, at least the, those women lucky enough to escape, you know, dying in childbirth and accidents and infection, all that. Like if you could get past all those hazards, then you live, you would live to 70, like that 70 or 80, that's not new. And so that really, and also that potentially that was a very valuable time of life that these post-reproductive women were valuable non-reproductive members of our human groups, which we really needed um, as Amazing. part of our evolution. And so that just basically tells the story that post-reproductive is inherently healthy. You know, there's life after the reproductive years. I've actually, now that I'm in menopause myself, I've sort of reframed, I've got this whole thing going on in my book about, you know, second girlhood, this sort of making this analogy with childhood, which is kind of interesting. So you, I now kind of see maybe female physiology, the baseline is actually the low, relatively low levels of hormones. We're making our estrogen inside cells with aromatase, you know, we're, built, we're doing it that way. And that the the three or four decades of reproductive years are amazing and important for building metabolic reserve and, you know, really great, but that's always meant to be temporary. Like, you know, pregnancies and cycles mm. and all the hormones that come with that, we get a big dose of that. And then we revert back to our more kind of lean conservative metabolism. Cause the thing about non-reproductive phase or post-reproductive phase from an evolutionary perspective we require fewer calories, which is kind of, you know, good and bad. Like, but mm. from a, if you think about it from an evolutionary perspective, that would have been a superpower. Like your baseline oh, metabolism point. is a little bit lower. So you can still get a lot of stuff done and actually eat less, which means there's more food for the children and the reproductive women, which we require. It, it takes, it's calorie intensive to be reproductive, basically to even be cycling, certainly to have babies. And then- so I don't know, I kind of feel like, I think we have this to acknowledge our metabolism shifts with menopause. And we always think of that as a bad thing, but from an evolutionary perspective, that would have been pretty great, actually. Slightly yeah, lower. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. So I have so many thoughts on that. So yeah. um, that would tell me then post-menopausal women are more in alignment with their um, design, their physiological, biological design when they're fasting. Cause you know, I love yeah, fasting. We're, we're supposed to be, I think our post-reproductive, I think we're supposed to be in an ideal world, 
metabolically leaning more to ketones. I think yeah. that would have probably been, um, because we do have this shift and we can talk about this as it relates to the brain. Like basically, as you probably know, estradiol, our main ovarian estrogen enhances the mitochondria's ability to burn glucose preferentially mm. to ketones. Like it makes it, you know, much more efficient at burning glucose, which kind of makes sense. I mean, I think when you're reproductive, you're going to need a lot of calories coming in. And um, there is this, we do for lots of reasons we can talk about, we, we, there is an imperative to be more metabolically flexible with menopause. I'll just call it menopause or post-menopause and more adept at using ketones for energy, whether that's with fasting or lower carb. I mean, as you know, there's lots of different ways to encourage that kind of metabolic flexibility. A lot yep. of it's to do with microbiome health and circadian rhythm and giving all the mitochondria, the nutri all the nutrients they need, like including things like magnesium can really help with that. I took the angle in my book of, of metabolic flexibility rather than yeah, because because I'm not keto myself, although I do definitely harness some an eating window and some overnight fasting and kind of lower carb in the morning. Like I've got a few things going on for myself, and then for my, but then that's all different for because I don't have insulin resistance. But I think this now kind of brings us into the conversation about for people who do have insulin resistance. Well, you know what? And, go yeah. ahead. No, you go. And then no, you got my brain insulin, going. You got no, because like, it, with insulin resistance that. A metabolic flexibility is impaired. So that's when you really do, I think, need some stronger interventions to regain the body's ability, the mitochondria's ability to burn ketones. That's something I talk about in my book quite a lot. Yeah. And your, your book's excellent, by the way. And yeah. you guys listening, I really encourage you to get it. I, you know, what I love about it is, um, so I, the, I dove into a couple chapters, easy to read, but you also, it's like a great resource to have uh, yeah. to go back and be like, this is the symptom I have. Okay. What am I doing? I'm all, I'm such yeah. a fan of checklists. Like, are yeah. you doing this? Are you doing this? Yeah. Especially for the menopausal woman. Cause you know, yeah. we, we can get a little crazy at times. So, but, but back to your point. So um, you know, the interesting thing about fasting and I've been teaching fasting on YouTube for several years now. Yeah. And I think what happened in the fasting world is that everybody, once they discovered fasting, intermittent fasting, longer fast, they thought that was the answer. But if you look into the research, especially the new England journal of medicine, the most, one of the most popular yep. meta-analysis on fasting, it's exactly what you just said. It's the switching it's the metabolic yep. switching is where the magic happens, which means we got to love food. We got to eat great food, but we also need to practice different styles of fasting. And what I'm hearing from you right now, and the thought that you kind of elevated for me is that if a postmenopausal woman is biologically designed to have less calories, if she's yep. doing standard Western diet, she is setting herself up for more disease because she's working against her biology. Absolutely. So it's food environment. I talk about food environments from a, I think, cause it also just takes a bit of pressure off people feeling less guilty about what they've been eating. Like yeah. it's our, we're like animals. We live in a food environment that unfortunately, as everyone knows is excess calories and empty calories and probably way too high carb and like trans fat. Like, you know, there's lots of things working against us in our food environment. And if you, yeah, potentially it with the, because with menopause in very simple terms, there's a shift to insulin resistance. We lose insulin sensitivity. So estradiol during our reproductive years gave us an edge over men in terms of maintaining insulin sensitivity. You, obviously you can still become mm -hmm. insulin resistant even when you're in your reproductive years, but it's, it's less likely. And then with the drop in estrogen, which actually happens kind of later in the perimenopause transition, but with the drop in estrogen, there's a shift to insulin resistance and that you won't go all the way to insulin resistance if you have put in place a good food environment, if you're moving and maintaining muscle mass and fasting overnight and you know all the multiple things, then you're gonna come through it okay and not have insulin resistance. But if you, if you do develop insulin resistance during menopause or heading into menopause or at some point, it has real consequences. I would argue that's mm -hmm. where a lot of that it can, one, it can worsen the symptoms of hot mm -hmm. flashes and mm -hmm. sleep. It is some really kind of scary things going on with the brain. We can talk about that. Yeah. I'd like that. to. 
Um, and two, the other thing, the shift with insulin resistance, the shift to insulin resistance with menopause is where a lot of the downstream health risks come from. So we hear this narrative that menopause increases the risk for cardiovascular disease. That's hundred percent true. But I would argue again, evolutionary mismatch that our ancestors didn't have that risk or that even today mm -hmm. women who get through, like get into menopause metabolically very healthy and with a great deal of metabolic flexibility and no insulin resistance, they're not going to have the downstream cardiovascular risk that is so typically kind of associated with menopause. And also just on that topic, one thing I've kind of come to understand, and I'm certainly happy to get, you know, feedback from other people, I think, and one of the, so you know how the research around estrogen and menopause and cardiovascular risk is all kind of mixed. Like it's mm -hmm. like, it's conflicting, yeah, right? It's like it's really like, mixed. yes, it, yes, it protects or no, it doesn't. I mean, there's tons of things going on with that, including of course, the types of hormone therapy that they used previously, oral estrogens cause clotting risk, all these things. And, you know, transdermal estrogen is safer. So there's all that. But also, I think one of the things that's going on is that, put it this way, women with, okay, if, if for women who have insulin resistance, taking estrogen is going to improve insulin sensitivity and reduce their cardiovascular risk. Women with normal insulin sensitivity are probably not going to get the benefits from estrogen in terms of those things. Interesting. Would you agree? Does that make yeah, sense? To you? I mean, I'm just like, I would so. Yeah. I would absolutely yeah. agree. And where my brain goes with that is, um, but insulin resistance can be overcome with yes. what we it's, eat and when we it's eat. True. It's reversible. It's reversible. So, yeah. So estrogen therapy is potentially, it's having a arguably it's helping to reverse insulin resistance, but it's not the only thing that can do that. Right. Like there's tons of other things. Other but Is there a strategies. down? Yeah. Is there a downside to HRT is what I assume you're chatting about? Well, I'm fairly agnostic when it comes, I mean, a lot of my patients take transdermal estrogen and I think, well, okay, put it this way on the HRT topic. Like if you're going to take it, take body identical, which in the States the is the yeah. for the progesterone component and take, if you're going to take estrogen, take it body identical and transdermal like through the skin, a patch or a gel or something that's way safer. And fortunately body identical, unlike even 10 years ago, body identical hormone therapy now is very easy to access because it's kind of the mainstream prescription now, but you have mm -hmm. to specifically know what in my book, I give a list of brands and awesome. I mean, I don't know. I think, um, I don't know. I'm happy to hear your thoughts. I mean, I guess I don't see if you're using lower dose and body identical hormone therapy, I don't see a I don't see many downsides. I'm pretty okay with it for my patients to use that. What are, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I mean, my, my approach to health always has been try to solve it naturally. First, look at your lifestyle, make those changes, look at how you could supplement with something that doesn't have any risk factors to it. So typically the herbs and supplement vitamins typically don't. Um, yeah. and then if that's not working, then that's when you have to le lean into more medication. I am not a fan of HRT. Um, right. I, I, I see too many, the, I see when people say here are the benefits, I'm like, I get that, but the risks are too big. Bioidenticals totally. Yes. If you can't solve it with lifestyle, I can, I can see a case for bioidenticals, but I, I think it's a, in, in light of what you're telling me right now. I think it's a little bit like exogenous ketones. When we first had right. exogenous ketones, people were like, well, I don't need to fast. I don't need to go into a ketogenic state. I'll just take the ketones and I'll get the benefits. So what you're saying is that if you are supplementing in with estrogen um, and it's the lack of estrogen that's making you more insulin resistant, is what drop I'm hearing. In estrogen. It's drop, the drop in estrogen. Drop. Yeah. Okay, so then we got to look at if we're going to metabolize and um, produce estrogen at its highest, we really also want to make sure we're staying in an insulin sensitive state, whether we're doing this through diet or medication, we insulin sensitivity is still at the root issue of menopause, regardless of the path that you take. I would agree. I think taking estrogen doesn't mean you don't have to do anything else for the exactly. insulin sensitivity. What about estrogen? So now I'm, I'm now I'm 
being the sort of the, the devil's advocate or I'm sort of I'm go just, for this it is a piece of information this is a, because there is a lot of fear around taking estrogen and like I said I'm fairly agnostic about it I think if it, you know if you want to if you feel better on it that's fine um a lot of my patients don't take it and that's fine too one interesting sort of statistic is um in terms of the breast cancer risk yeah and this is going to lead us into another topic here but <laughs> the risk from a low you know a, a modern transdermal estrogen patch plus prometrium plus the bioidentical progesterone that the breast cancer risk associated with that is actually lower than moderate alcohol drinking Ooh, so interesting i am just putting that out there in yeah, terms of a great. risk assessment because and this is leading us into alcohol because alcohol is not friendly to the perimenopausal brain and i say that i actually did have a drink last night so i'm not <laughs> totally off it yeah, I mean, I have, I go, I'll go months without it. And then because I'm visiting family and like, I, I have the occasional, very occasional, but I find that with myself and with my patients and many people that I've talked to, cutting alcohol, like seriously, you know, eliminating it at least for a little while can eliminate some of the symptoms, like including hot flushes and sleep disturbance. And it makes sense, right? Because changes are happening with the brain. So let's kind of loop back. Yeah. To the let's brain, go into so many- that. Yeah. Yeah, because ultimately, there's a paper I cite in my book, basically, where the basically the basic premise is perimenopause is predominantly neurological. I mean, there's also heavy periods, there's mm. other things going on in your 40s, but let's just from the brain perspective, there's a recalibration of the brain. This is analogous to first puberty, where there's a recalibration of the brain because hormones have a huge effect on the brain. So it's undergoing quite a profound, the brain is undergoing quite a profound recalibration process in our forties. And that's, we know that's happening because it's actually what's called a critical window or a tipping point for neurological conditions. I mean, the risk is still low, but basically we know like for the onset of serious mental health conditions, there's certain windows, there's puberty, (laughs) there's postpartum, there's perimenopause. These are all very similar things that I call in my book. I talk about as a tipping point or kind of an inflection Mm. point because this like like a computer software update basically is going on. That's another good analogy. Like, you know, when your computer software is updating, you're not supposed to turn it off or do anything. You need to just let it Mm. happen as best it can. And I think if that's one of our jobs in our forties is to try to, as best we can, support our brain health while it undergoes this recalibration. And then we're potentially, you know, going to pop out the other end once we get in, achieve menopause or graduate to menopause one year after our final period, the brain will be in its new steady state and should Mm. be a lot more resilient really than it would be during these years. I love that. There's risk. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. No. So, okay. So let's start off with this because one thing that I feel like women are not hearing enough is the anxiety, the depression, your inability to handle stress. This is because of what you just said. I love the idea of it's a brain recalibration, but what women are, are doing when those symptoms appear is they're turning to SSRIs, they're getting divorced. They're, you know, what leaving jobs because they feel that it's their, it's the problem is outside of them. But if they understood yeah. that the brain was recalibrating, they yeah. may have a little more compassion for themselves and the people around them. So give me some examples of like, what are the major symptoms and then how yeah. can we assist the body in that recalibration? Yeah. Absolutely. So the symptoms is a triple three times higher risk of anxiety and depression during our forties. Amen. Keep in mind, we're talking about <laughs> perimenopause. We're talking about the t- up to 10 years before the final period, or maybe up to 10 years before the 12 months after the final period, kind of that, that's the, the period of perimenopause. And the other, just to say again, it's the risk is temporary and it's hard when you're in the middle of it, mm-hmm. you think, okay, I've, I'm anxious now. It's hard to remember. You're not always going to be like that for one thing. And also there's things you can do. So increased risk of anxiety and depression resurgence of migraine frequency mm-hmm. this is a this is usually people who had migraines before but mm-hmm. they will that's a classic symptom and they start you can start getting these monthly migraines again sleep disturbance is 
probably right up there. The other neurological symptom is the night sweats. Often in the earlier pre perimenopausal years, those will be premenstrual night sweats. So it won't be like you're having hot flashes all the time, but you do, you potentially can go through, um, yeah, a few days, you know, a few days of that. Okay. So that's, that adds up yeah. to quite a lot. And then from the sleep disturbance, you can get fibromyalgia. This is where I sort of talked about this, you know, downstream from that, you can start to get pain syndromes and absolutely where women resort to is SSRIs, which I'll just point out, like I have lots of worries about SSRIs. The biggest one actually is that they have an osteoporosis risk. So that's oh, not a good time to be the research I've seen. I mean, not and again, not to scare people, because it's certainly, you don't want to make any rapid changes. This is like a long-term thing to think about. But the research that I've seen is that the bone risk from SSRIs is equivalent, is as bad as corticosteroids. So Interesting. Wow. It's not, a, it's not insignificant, potentially. I mean, the research is still being done. Yeah. Um, and then also, of course, women are turning to alcohol. And I get it because you're anxious and you need to calm down, you know, at the end of the day, try to sleep. But I'm saying to everyone, I'm just like hand on heart. Alcohol is not the solution. Yeah. It's, it's just not it's a brain. It's a brain top poison. And I mean, yeah. not to overstate it, it, it worsens intestinal permeability. It's just not helpful. So those are some of the symptoms. The other thing that's happening with the brain recalibration, we alluded to this earlier, is a what I call an energy crisis of the brain. So this is later in the process, later around the time of the final period when estrogen is really going down. You get this redu reduction of metabolic functioning. You get up to what the researchers have found. There's a couple of researchers um, that I quote in the book, and most people have probably heard of them. Roberta Brinton and um, Lisa Moscone. Yeah, I like happened Lisa's to, book my, my menopausal brain was able to <laughs> retrieve re re those names. I'm with yeah, you. Um, it's working. Um, they, there are a couple of neuroscientists, they've teamed up on this. So what they've discovered is with the drop in estrogen, there's an up to 25% drop in brain energy. And that, they're picking up brain energy by doing these scans where they see like the brain lighting up as it's producing ATP basically is it's, you know, producing energy and 25% drop is quite a lot. It's huge. I mean, that's quite, it's quite scary. And it's because the mitochondria have temporarily lost. Well, they, I mean, they, not temporarily, they, they, they're less, they're less able to use glucose for energy. There's an imperative to start to use ketones for energy, preferably ketones from diet or from the burning, the body's burning the body, body's own fat, as you know, like that's the mm -hmm. best way, mobilize them. And then the brain can use those ketones. Roberta Brinton in one of her papers, and I can provide the citation for this. She talks about um, if the brain can't do that, if it can't readily access ketones, usually because of insulin resistance, it will resort to cannibalizing the myelin crazy of the nearby cells crazy um which if you just think about that it's not good no. and that is potentially where the met one of the mechanisms probably one of several mechanisms that what both these researchers um, Moscone and Brinton have proposed that menopause is is when dementia starts at menopause basically right right um the risk as you know probably know I mean dementia women are three times more likely to get dementia compared yeah. to men there's probably several reasons for that, but one of them is, I'd say one of the reasons is, uh, is menopause is an evolutionary mismatch through menopause is this brain crisis that the, if you can't successfully navigate that and gain, you know, regain metabolic flexibility and brain health, you are on the track to dementia that could probably not manifest for another 10 or 15 years, but the stakes are high, right? That is not a small thing. No. This is why, so now in our household, I mean, I do, like I said, I don't have insulin resistance, so I'm not super strict with my diet, but occasionally if there's like a dessert on the, on offer and I'll say to my husband, yeah, I'm not going to have that because I don't want my brain to eat itself. Like, oh, this, um, <laughs> That's actually probably helpful because to overcome a temptation, if you understand yeah. the, the consequence of it, Yeah. would you say then that the most important thing 
that a perimenopause, menopause, postmenopausal woman could do is make herself do everything she could to become insulin sensitive? I'd say it's pretty, it's right up there. I guess the way I phrase it in my book is it's priority to identify insulin resistance and okay. reverse it. Because What was the second thing resistance. instead of rehearse it? I, no, and reverse it. Oh, reverse it. I'm like, yeah. how, do we, what, how do we rehearse it? More dessert? Sorry. Identify insulin resistance with proper testing. We could talk okay. about, I don't know what you do, but I could talk about how I assess for it and then reverse it and make that a priority. Yeah. 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 T- yeah. Talk about how you test because I've had, um, I don't know if you know Ben Bickman. He's a uh, PhD researcher out of Utah and his specialty is insulin resistance. And when I asked him about hemoglobin A1C, what did he think of that? He's like, I don't think that's a good measurement of what your insulin. Yeah. So you agree. So talk about what, how would one like listening to this podcast, is there blood work that they could go and have done? Can they go look at the blood work and interpret it different? So So what I do, I would say the, well, I said the gold standard from a clinical perspective is, um, a glu- an oral glucose tolerance test with insulin, which is also called a glucose insulin response test. It goes by different names in different countries, but basically it's that test where you take a fast, they take a fasting sample, a uh, blood sample, uh, but where they're measuring both glucose and insulin. This is the key part. And then you do a glucose challenge drink. And then at the one and two hour marks, you're measuring both glucose and insulin, the hormone insulin. So that's fairly sensitive. I sometimes yeah. try to fudge it by just doing a fasting insulin. Like I think with someone with severe insulin resistance, fasting insulin will be elevated. And mm-hmm. then that's, you know, that's what, a- and, um, that we, we would see that either in fasting insulin, or we'd see it in hemoglobin A1C. Is that well, kind again, of, I don't know. I think you can have pretty strong insulin resistance and still a fairly uh, normal have those no, Yeah. I mean, it's about hyperinsulinemia, right? So yeah. it, it depends at some point in the progression, glucose is going to go high as well. And there's the, sort of the whole issue of glucose control, but I guess I still find value in testing insulin. The other, just for anyone listening, like you could probably already use your existing blood work. To That's what I'm clues. thinking. Yeah. Yeah. So well, clue number one is weight gain around the waist. So that apple shaped obesity is weight gain is pretty classic. Yep. So are things like skin tags are pretty and I think they actually form because insulin hyper, you know, insulin is high. Insulin is a growth hormone. So you start getting growth, like skin tags and fibroids and, you know, things like that. So, um, also triglycerides are typically high with insulin resistance yep. and ALT, the liver enzyme ALT, mm-hmm. especially if the other liver enzymes are not high. So this is fatty liver. Basically fatty liver is downstream from insulin resistance. It can, because be because of other things too, but it's both sort of fatty liver is both caused by insulin resistance and causes insulin resistance. It's part of the part of the process. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. okay. So what let's help, let's address the woman who's going through this process. She's listening to this. She's like, okay, I got to get insulin resistance under control. But when the waves of depression and anxiety hit, uh, we know the brain is trying to recalibrate itself. We shouldn't be drinking alcohol. What, what are, what are other tools that we have? Like, where does cannabis fit in? Where does THC yeah. fit in? Where does sure. Sammy, like what, what can we do to help yeah. women as their brain is recalibrating, knowing that right. they need to make sure that they're handling insulin resistance? For sure. So I have in my book, I call it the basic action plan for brain rewiring or brain recalibration. So, um, pretty much I always start with magnesium and taurine. We have these beautiful magnesium taurine powders in Australia, New Zealand. I haven't really been able to find something quite equivalent in North America, but those two nutrients plus accessory B vitamins and zinc and can really support the mitochondria, support the hippocampus and the brain, you know, support GABA receptors. So let's talk about progesterone. Yes, <laughs> because please. We've talked a lot about estrogen, yeah. but actually- progesterone, and the reason I'm segueing to this is because of the brain. So progesterone, the hormone we make after ovulation and with pregnancy, is quite a special hormone that is not that easy to make. And we don't make that much of it normally, but what we do make is quite precious. And it acts on 
GABA receptors in the brain. So progesterone, arguably, and there's quite a few papers about this, has a regulating effect, a calming effect on the brain, and, a, and helps to regulate the HPA axis, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And so losing progesterone, even in the early phases of perimenopause, that's where the migraines, anxiety, sleep disturbance typically comes from. So with my basic action plan, kind of got multiple prongs. The first is just go in and support the GABA receptors. Just give them what they need, you know, magnesium and taurine, ginseng glycine. Um, I do talk about CBD oil for perimenopausal sleep. There's at least one study on that that could be awesome. straight CBD or mixed with THC for sleep. Um, and then all the other things that you can do for brain health. So getting outside, <laughs> supporting circadian rhythm, eating protein, in the morning and you know, giving your brain enough amino acids and breathing exercises. And I'm a big yoga fan. You know, yoga is one example of mm -hmm. kind of movement synchronized with breathing that helps to stimulate the vagus nerve. We can, mm -hmm. we can harness the vagus nerve to have a calming effect on the brain. We can cut alcohol, especially like it's much, much easier to cut alcohol if you are on magnesium and taurine and some CBD oil and some anxiolytic herbal medicines to help reduce stress, regular movement. So those are all, those are the basic. Yeah. So what I, what basic. I, yeah. yeah, what I hear, yeah. And I want, I'm hoping people ca caught this. Yeah. Um, I really feel like the way our healthcare system has trained us is there's one pill for one symptom and right. my own menopausal journey has taught me that is not the case and that no. you need an arsenal of things to work on and know when to pull these tools out. But what you're even elevating that to the place of like, if you supplement with these, with these key nutrients that will support GABA receptors and, yep. um, and keep, uh, and I, I, we can also chat about how do we keep progesterone at its best, yes. Um, yes. then you're going to not need to turn to the alcohol as much. Because exactly. you're dealing, you're, you're working in alignment with what your body needs as it goes through this recalibration, which I love. So, Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Keep going. Yeah. No. So project. So what can we do? So we open up, we, I love all those nutrients. Is there a way to maximize progesterone production as it's plummeting through menopause? To a point. I mean, eventually, no, eventually it's, it's gone. Like, yeah. you know, um, but the way I talk about it, I have a chapter in my book called cycle while you can, like, as long as you mm. can still ovulate, do it because that's how you make progesterone. So that usually requires removing an obstacle to ovulation. That's the way I think about it, of which I'll point out, um, contraceptive drugs are a major obstacle to ovulation and there's mm. no progesterone in any form of hormonal birth control. Then you know, the ne next kind of obstacle to ovulation would be a thyroid, like thyroid disease. So if you have a thyroid disease, then address that. And that will enable you to ovulate and make more progesterone. If you have, again, insulin resistance or like a PCOS type state, then correct that. And you can regain some years of ovulation and mm. progesterone. For some women at some point, it can be helpful to take progesterone. So I have personally taken progesterone. So I'm happy to disclose that, you know, I mm -hmm. certainly love my patients do not everyone, but it can be for sleep in particular, because progesterone capsules, and we're talking now body identical progesterone in the U S it's eat most easily obtained as prometrium. It is for the, well, it's usually tranquilizing and sleep promoting. There's the about one in 20 women have kind of a different reaction to it, which we can go into or leave for another interview, but it's most of the time it's yeah, it's quite calming. And so a lot of my, in my book, a lot of the writing I've done about potentially taking progesterone comes from Professor Geraldine Pryor. Do you know, have you heard of her? Do you mm, know her? She's a, yeah. at the University of British Columbia. She's got a, um, an organization called the Center for Menstruation and Ovulation Research. I'm actually on their oh. scientific advisory board. So she's a, a clinician, an endocrinologist and a scientist. And she's done dozens of studies over the years on progesterone she's a big fan of if you know for those women who need something support through the perimenopause transition and she totally acknowledges that not everyone does but she's a big advocate for progesterone alone so mm -hmm. progesterone without estrogen and real progesterone and using it 
for the brain to support the brain to promote sleep and also potentially lightens period lightens periods quite dramatically which is mm. another thing yeah. that could be going on with um with perimenopause so progesterone is sometimes part one of my recommendations for my patients if, if I can see they need something because of the sleep because of the migraines um yeah so progesterone GABA is a big part of the brain recalibration okay bring something yeah. else into it yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So are there yeah. like one thing that I've discussed is that there, if you look at certain foods that help with progesterone production, what I find is so interesting is they're not keto foods. If you like dive into food sources, you're looking at squashes and potatoes, and there's some evidence around citrus fruits that can actually help with production of progesterone. Do you yeah, feel I, like that's, that's accurate? Uh, yeah. I don't think there's any foods. I mean, I, what we, of course, we all of us have a baseline kind of chatter level of progesterone. It's one of our hormones that's kind of there everywhere, but at, at a very small level. But the, the levels of progesterone that we were used to from our reproductive years, I don't think there's like there's no way with food to replace that. It's either coaxing your ovaries into ovulating if they can mm. still do it. Talking them into that. Talking them into it. Still, if they can hey, you got some there. eggs down there. Come on. Yeah, come to me. on. Let's do <laughs> a few more few more months of cycling um or taking it potentially yeah okay and so, what about what about stress so it, yeah it, you know we know when cortisol comes up that that can tank down tank progesterone so do do you think for the menopausal woman that stress is going to be contribute to the loss of progesterone Yes, probably not because of that pregnant alone progesterone steel thing. Ah, I don't okay. think that's actually that I, that's actually not quite what's going on. But certainly, stress can impair ovulation. So it all comes back to if you were trying to make your own progesterone, it all comes back to can you ovulate, and for how long? Like like by for how long? I mean um, the duration of the luteal phase. If your listeners know what I mean, like that post ovulatory phase, like when we're young, that should be about fourteen days. It starts to shorten as we get older. So we're just making fewer days of progesterone every cycle. You can track that with basal body temperatures to try to understand if you're mm -hmm. ovulating. But um, the, po the postmenopausal yeah. woman, she's got less progesterone. Oh, so it's yeah. just, it's just the re what I'm hearing is it's, it's the recalibration yeah. is where we get caught the most. Yes. So the nope. brain is trying to get used to its new lower hormone state. And again, like circling back to the beginning of our conversation where, you know, arguably menopause evolved is natural is normal. Women were even traditionally quite healthy for, you know, several decades post reproduction. Brain can recalibrate to that. I mean, children are healthy, have healthy brains with low levels of hormones. Like I think the brain Good is point. plastic. It can get, it can get back there. Um, it, it is a, a change though. It's quite a challenging change. And one thing that does, I'll just differentiate between progesterone and estrogen is that progesterone is interesting in that it um, has less of, it's less addictive, but that way. estrogen is actually quite addictive. And in what, in what way? In terms of the brain, like if the brain gets used to, it will really feel, you know, the drop in, East, in estrogen kind of arguably more dramatically, which is actually just why the reason I'm kind of using this as an example is that Professor Pryor makes this point. You can take progesterone through the perimenopausal years and then just stop at any time. Like, you know, eventually mm. your brain's like, that's fine. Like I'm good without the progesterone. But um, if you take, if you get on, this is one thing about hormone therapy, actually, if you get on estrogen therapy, you will, and you eventually want to come off you will have to taper it down. Cause if you just went from a sort of higher dose patch to nothing, you would a hundred percent go into like hot flashes and the whole thing. Like, so the, in that sense, estrogen is addictive. Right. Um, I, I want to say, just while I'm thinking of it actually on terms of brain and mood, and I really want to make sure I touch on another aspect that's going on. Please. High estrogen and histamine. Mm. So in especially in the earlier phases of perimenopause, like I think I said earlier, estrogen can be up to spiking up to three times higher than during our thirties. And, you know, earlier, like it, it's so a lot of that's to do with just the drop in, oh, the, sorry, the increasing FSH and, you know, stimulating the ovaries to make more estrogen. And when estrogen is high, depending on the immune system of the individual, 
that can stimulate a histamine response. So a lot of the, again, explain. I think what I see is, so histamine would yeah, be- Yeah, explain that so people know. Yeah, so high, so this would be mast cell activation. Um, mast cells release a lot of inflammatory compounds, actually, including heparin, which is why histamine and mast cells play a role in heavy bleeding, because there's a lot mm. of mast cells in the uterine lining, but there's mast cells everywhere, like in the gut. And then, and when they release histamine, histamine is a neurotransmitter that causes, you know, fluid retention, anxiety, sleeplessness. So I've had a number of patients and readers give me the feedback that they actually feel like the high estrogen, high histamine is a big factor in their sleep disturbance and perimenopause as well, which is why antihistamines can work quite well for, well, I mean, they do work for sleep, but, you know, for calming for mood, for some of the dialed up premenstrual mood symptoms from um, migraines also have a histamine component. So okay. that's definitely something that's going on for some women during these. And what's, periods. is there a natural solution to histamines? Yeah. Well, my number one thing is, well, no alcohol. That's another place where alcohol is not friendly as it mm -hmm. activates, you know, releases mast cells. Um, no dairy. So we can talk mm. about this a little bit. You know, I think I, I will, I, I would estimate that amongst my patients about one in four, one in three are fine with totally fine with cow's dairy, like no reaction at all. I think it's the, the maybe more like two out of three people seem to be reacting to some extent. And I think it's a lot to do with the A1 casein and the, mm. um, the kind of opiate, you know, about this, right? The little peptide that it forms yep. in certain people in their gut. Some people don't form it at all. So some people, that's why some people are just, I can imagine like some people are fine with cow's dairy and think, what's the big deal? Like, you know, it's hundred percent fine. And some people get a strong inflammatory reaction to dairy. And part of that is why the mast cells, which is why I, yeah, dairy free, or at least trying a few months cows dairy free or avoiding a one casein specifically is one of my go-tos for heavy periods and premenstrual mood symptoms. And so that can be quite a game changer. Yeah. If, what if I do sheep or goat and what if I yeah. do, I do raw or I do a two cows? Yeah. So sheep, goat, and A2 are usually fine. So A2, so okay. none of those have A1 casein. Right. So yeah, I usually with my patients, yep. Sheep or goat, or even like butter is fine or potentially like sort of a heavier cream, like a fuller, like the more fat there is, right. the less protein there is. So the less room there is for the A1 casein to, okay. yeah, to be there. And, but, and I would think with raw, it doesn't, it really doesn't matter because you still got oh, the A1. I, no, so like still, raw goat might be the best. Oh yeah. So it, it just depends on the animal, right? Whether they're make, and a lot of, my understanding is a lot of dairy farmers, at least down under are quietly all switching to A2 because they didn't want to kind of acknowledge the, some of the research around A1 casein being inflammatory, but they must see the writing on the wall and are just, because I, I think, mean, at some, at some point, pro most probably dairy will not be inflammatory once it's all switched over. And some parts of the world, my understanding is, you know, in some parts of the world, um, most, even cow's dairy is A2. So. Explain the difference just real briefly, because I think when I first learned A1 versus A2, I was like, what? There's different milk coming out of different cows? Like, isn't it all milk? And I think pe the listeners might need to know that. Right. So it's just, it's just the presence of, it's only Holstein, what we call down under Frisian cows, only that breed, which is unfortunately the main dairy breed, they make... A1 casein in the milk is actually quite a recent evolutionarily. It's, it's actually only in the last, I don't, you know, several centuries that it's sort of been bred, selected for, for whatever reason in cows. And so, yeah, you just basically A2 animals are just, well, like I said, like you have to be a cow to make A1 casein for starters, and then not all cows make it. So you just, they do, what they do is the farmers just genetically test. They can tell from a gene test if the cows makes that or not yeah so, yeah and yeah. I, I i i'd like to say here in america we're switching to a2 but i don't know i, I am seeing yeah. it more in the in the grocery stores so yeah. um you guys if you're listening go to your grocery store a lot of a lot of people will there are a lot of options now for a2 that are in there yeah um it would be great if everybody switched over so yeah i love that but yeah it's just quite a simple change and yeah. i see quite dramatic results with patients sometimes just making that change 
Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Well, yeah. I have about a hundred and a yeah. thousand more questions for you, but, um, I just want to respect your time. And I think we got to bring you back because yeah. this is, you know, hormones is, I, I, I can never talk about it enough. I think it's really interesting. And, you know, with yeah. the menopause, with menopause, what I found going through the whole experience was just women aren't talking about it. And I, and I love what you said today about the need for women, postmenopausal women to the community and yeah. how primal like that alone, I would hope would help women see that going through this process as smoothly as you can, because the world needs you on the other side of it. It's so true. It's a beautiful way to put it. The world needs us. Yeah. Yeah. It's always been like that. As long as we've been human, we have been very important members of the group and yeah. we still are. Yeah. And you, you know that intuitively. I mean, you just look around you, you see like women in their, you know, fifties and sixties, just getting stuff done. Like, seriously, oh yeah. Taking care of business kind of thing. Yep. It's, um, yeah, it's, and they're, it's, it's they're, very they're less, uh, yeah. they're less, they, they're, um, less tolerant of, you know, adverse, uh, behaviors. Yeah. They don't worry as much. Like I, I'd rather yeah. hang out with a, a 60 year old on most days than a 30 year old. So, uh, I mean, just saying depends on the person. So yeah, it depends on the person. Yeah. yeah. Let's yeah. let's, I want to finish up with, with five questions for you. Okay. Um, okay. and, uh, uh, some of them are unique to you. Some of them are just, we ask everybody and gathering sure. some good information. The, sure. the first one I'm really gathering, I love books. Um, and I'm gathering a book list, like a book club of all of our guests and what their favorite books are. So if you yeah. had one to two books that you were like every person, it doesn't have to be women centric. Oh, wow. Every person should read this book. What would it be? It could be women. It could be hormonal related too. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I, I will, I think I'm going to mention again, I mentioned it earlier, the slow moon climbs. I'm a huge fan of that book. If you're at all interested in human evolution or women, or, you know, just, this is the one that reframes basically makes the argument that human longevity evolved because of menopause. Um, oh my goodness. I don't know. In terms of other books, I read a lot of books on, I read a lot of fiction. Oh yeah. What I do you read? read? I'm currently reading, I'll just say that because I can, it's um, called Hamnet. It's about um, Shakespeare's children, his wife and his children. So it's a sort of historical cool. fiction. Um, I also read a lot of books on paleontology and biology. That's because I was Love a it. biologist first. So Oh, you know what? I would say one. I mean, this is just, this, this is the great thing about these rapid fire questions. You just don't know what is going to come <laughs> up. But the book that comes to mind is called The Hidden Life of Trees. Mm. And if anyone's interested in the natural world, it's by Peter, I forget his last name. It's a German forester and it's translated. It, it's, um, it's one of those books where I feel like if you're interested in the natural world, it, there's kind of a before and after reading that book. Like after yeah. you've read it, you can never look at forests the same he oh, basically is kind of arguing that there's a degree of consciousness i guess with trees Ooh. which is um quite I'll beautiful put that on my list I, yeah. I love that okay if yeah. you could go back to your 20 year old self and you yeah. could give her hormone advice oh what, right what hormone advice would you give her yeah to slow down take maybe just stress less just stress less you know yeah yeah that's, i mean I guess in retrospect, I think, yeah, I had more time than I, I don't know. I, just, I was always quite a type A kind of really worrying about things and trying to get things done. And in, in the end, you know, from the perspective of 30 years later, probably a lot of that didn't That's matter. Right. I should have just kicked back a little. Right. Yeah. Yes. I would probably tell my 20 year old self the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, in the pandemic, we've had a lot of, you know, bashing of 2020 and 2021, but there's also been right. a lot of real gems for people. And uh, you've been in New Zealand, I, the, the lockdowns have been big, but there were gifts that people had. So what are some of your ahas or gifts of the last year, year and a half? Well, I get, well, for me, again, the thing that comes to mind is um, just prioritizing what's important like I mm. I guess the thing I've done I can I think I mentioned this I, I'm, I live in New Zealand but I traveled to Canada this year to see my parents who are still alive thank goodness and you know my immediate family and some friends here and so just prioritizing that over almost anything this year was just made me realize that that some of those relationships are 
those relationships are very important. So and, true. Yeah, so true. Yeah. I would, I would agree. Um, overall family, you know, I've always prioritized family, but I feel like they took a whole nother level yeah. of, um, of like honoring over the last year and a half from everything from my children to my parents and just yeah. how precious time with them is. So I it's would such, agree. It, yeah. Cause I went from this mode of, I'm sure we all were in 2019, planning all just international, you know, speaking engagements, all I've got yeah. this and this and ticking off all these things to like the, I, like this year I said to my friends, like, I've got a singular, like one goal in 2021, which is to get to see my, the people I love in Canada, like, like oh, nothing else matters. I just let all the other, some of the work things just fall away. It's like, I can't, I have to just do this one thing. So I that, that, that was, that's important. I love it. Okay. What, if you could define health, what, how would you define it? Like I, one thing that I've been thinking about is that we tend to think of health as like a noun, like, or like a destination, but I look at it more like a verb, like it's an yeah. action. I think if we're all trying to get healthy, well, what does that mean? How would we define that? Well, I guess in simplest terms, it would be, you know, having the ability to do what you gives you joy mm. to do. Like, and of course that will change over time. And that sort of does change. Like if you've got, some people have particularly health challenges that they may never totally overcome, but like they're still looking for maximizing, you know, what, what they, the amount of joyful, like, you know, existence that they, they can. And so a lot, I, and this, it's a good question. Cause I, I've talked about it with my audience a little bit. Health is not a destination because if, if you think of it as, as perfect health, if you're always going for perfect health, you're never going to get there actually, yep. because Amen. It, then if I've had patients, I'm sure you've had the same where actually trying to achieve some kind of perfect health becomes their life work, which is actually really sad to see because then they're not doing the other thing. So sometimes I say, you know, to, even to myself or to patients, like, I think you're good enough. Like, this is pretty good. Like you're good and like you can go like in my case it's like I'm healthy enough to go on a walking holiday or you know to travel to see my family and other guys certainly I don't I'm not perfect but I don't need to be perfect yeah so it's like a state is what I hear yeah. it's like when you're in a state of health you the joys you want in life whether it's vacationing connection with people exercising you're able to do all that and with yes. without discomfort without anxiety depression but when we look at it like somewhere I'm get, something I'm trying to get or something I'm where I'm trying to go, that's where I think we constantly set ourselves up for failure. Is that, yeah. would you agree? And it's anxiety produ yes. ex producing too, because you're just always worried about, well, I could be healthier. I could be doing this thing. I, it becomes this lifelong self-improvement project, which is, yeah, not, not a good place right. to be. So. Totally agree. Okay. Last yeah. question. If you had yeah. one message for the world that you could get into oh. everybody's brain, what would that message be? Oh, Mindy, that's hard. I, um, I know, you could, it's okay. You can pick one today and your message could be- I would just say, honestly, I would just say life is short. I mean, I know that sounds a little pessimistic, but like life is precious. And you know, our, the life that we have and the, mm -hmm. the time we get to spend with our companions, we talked about that a little bit, but also I guess more broadly, I guess from speaking from a biologist, like life, you know, life is precious like the biodiversity the plants and animals that we were so lucky to be on the planet mm. with I'd like to see some of them stay around I mean I, I guess I would like to I like to see a lot of the conservation and I, I mean I think climate change is important too like I'm just saying but in terms of the conservation message I'd like a lot of it to kind of shift to promoting biodiversity because that's what's the health of the ecosystem right is I lots of different that health yeah. and animals. So I don't know, I kind of feel like, I think we have this to acknowledge our metabolism shifts with menopause and we always think of that as a bad thing, but from an evolutionary perspective, that would have been pretty great actually. Slightly yeah, lower. And, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I have so many thoughts on that. So yeah. um, that would tell me then post-menopausal women, 